Well, we're speaking about Eretz Yisrael, Medinat Yisrael, which is part of Eretz Yisrael. I remember my first visit to Israel in 1961. I was staying with some friends and family members in Yerushalayim. And the two things that are very close to me in terms of memory, I had a cousin who lived in Derech Hebron, Yerushalayim, and from the back of his house, you could see the Jordanian border. I went out and had my camera, and I wanted to take a picture of Jordanian soldiers, the famous legion, and, and their posts. They must have noticed me, because they pointed their guns straight at me. I was able to move a little, and that was the end of that experience. You had Jordanian soldiers about maybe half a block away from where I was staying. And I said to myself, how long will this go on? How long will they be able to attack us? My next experience was, I wanted to see the old city. So somebody told me that if I go to the uh, monastery of Notre Dame in Yerushalayim, on the top floor you can see the Yerushalayim under the Jordanians. And I saw buses going back and forth. And I said to myself, will I ever able to see that part of Yerushalayim reunited with us? I never thought I would. And here, Baruch Hashem, we are today. Jordanian, Jordanian soldiers are gone, no longer threatening us. And uh, Yerushalayim under our control all of it. I never thought I'd be able to see it in my lifetime. And yet here we are, Hakol uh, Biyadeno. It's all in our hands. The question is, what do we do with it? I don't mean politically. Do we appreciate the great miracle of returning to us those parts of the ocean line, the Israel which really belong to us? We live in a generation today but younger people don't appreciate it. But those of my age who went to Israel before 67 and never thought they'd able to see it again, completely reunited, has taken place. really came true for people in my generation. I hope we prove worthy of it and be able to do what the Shem wants us to do, living the life of Am Kodesh, a holy nation, in Eretz HaKodesh. Medina Israel and Eretz Israel have been a, a blessing for me in my own life, personally, because I think that is where I really began to grow up. I was fortunate to spend time studying in Yeshiva after high school. I began when I was about 17 or 18. And besides for the learning in the Yeshiva that made a big impact in my life, I was also able to spend time visiting other parts of Eretz Israel, other communities. The yeshiva was situated in Yerushalayim in the old city. But besides that, I remember I would spend Shabbos in Tel Aviv, and B'nai Brak, Sfat, a lot. And even when I had chances, even when I had free time from yeshiva, it made it my business to go around, to go see. And I saw all different kinds of Jews, all different kinds of people. And they all had something special in their approaches to life and, and to Judaism. And I remember thinking that, well, whatever I would spend, this, whatever I would spend time, I, I thought to myself, I, I, I want to be like that, or I want to be like this. Obviously, you can't do that, but it was the ability to see each one individually and, and to take from them and to incorporate it into to me, who it was that, that I wanted to be and who it is that I still want to be. And that experience was something that I am forever thankful for. And I carry those memories and those lessons with me to, to this day. I have just one, one humorous, if I could call it that, one, cute, one cutish kind of story. Um, on, on Yom Azikaro, a, uh, a very sad day, 
throughout the country. I spent I spent the time at Har Herzl with a friend of mine. We went for the Tekis and we went to spend some time. And as we're walking around the the cemetery, me and my friend, who could not look more American than he than he did, we bumped into President Azar Weitzman. And we began to schmooze, we had a conversation. So he asks us, Oh, what yeshiva do you do you fellows learn in? And we answered, we learned yeshiva at Akoto. So has the yeshiva. So his response to us was, Oh, a temba tankim. You are in tanks. And we just kind of smiled and, and said yes. And uh, I moved on. It was, uh, it was meaningful to us to be there and to participate in that. And like I said, every experience there was, was special. Talk about the miracle of the birth of the State of Israel and its blessings. There's so much that can be said, we can stand here for hours and hours and, and discuss it. But one of the first uh, implications and impacts of the State of Israel that I think of, and its significance to us as a Jewish people, is the fact that it gave us a sense of hope after a very desperate time. It's reminiscent of Rabbi Akiva's famous statement when he witnessed the, the fox running through the Beis HaMikdash and where he was smiling and his colleagues were crying and he said he explained to, them why, why, he explained to his colleagues why, are, why is he smiling because he knew that this very prophecy which forecast the time that there will be foxes running the Beis HaMikdash meant that the good times will come as well when there will be the restoration of the Beis HaMikdash, that prophecy will also come true. And I think what we've seen is that the people of Israel have gone through such calamity right during World War II, and it could have been the end of the people the way we know it. It would have been total doom and despair, and we would have been a people of despair. The fact that there was a rebirth of the people through the state of Israel gave us hope for renewal, and it gave us a, the inspiration of knowing that he made Layon Veloyishan Shemei Yisrael, that Hashem has seen us through all the dark times and has carried us through glorious times as well, and that it's not just the bad things, it's not just the pogroms, it's not just the exiles, it's not just the Chilnitskis, it's not just the inquisitions, but God is with us throughout, and here he's finally held us our hand to bring us to back to our homeland after 2,000 years or so of, of exile. And so I think that's one of the, the great things, the meaning uh, of the State of Israel is that it renewed our sense of vigor as a Jewish people. When I think about my own experiences um, in Eretz Yisrael, and trying to figure how is this country, this people, this city, Yushalayim, how is it different than any other country for us as a Jewish people? I think in the days that I first came to Israel in 1969, the summer of 69, I went with a group which included uh, some Balabatim from our young Israel at that time, and my father and uh, the Holzer family. And we were walking through the back streets of Yerushalayim and we came across uh, a little town, a little part of the town where the Salonim Yeshiva is, right in the rear of, of Me Sha'arim. And um, this was uh, the beginning of Chodesh El, as it were. And I remember I seen there was this old man and he was fixing windows in the Salonim Yeshiva. And little children were throwing pebbles at him. The little Hasidic boys were throwing pebbles at him. And I, uh, and I turned to Rabbi Weinberg, Zafon of Rabbi David Weinberg, he was the Menial then of the yeshiva of the Salonim of the Salonim of Mostos. I said, well, why are these kids throwing pebbles at this poor little old man? And they said, ah, he said, this man was a glazier and he was fixing windows of yeshiva. These kids know that he has a tainus dibur when it comes to Chodesh Yavu, meaning 
that the entire Chodesh Elul he doesn't speak anything extraneous unless it's for davening or for learning, period. And these little kids are taunting him to see if they get him to say something by throwing these pebbles at him, but he didn't yield. And I began to realize, you know, this Yerushalayim is indeed different than any other city in the world. Where is it you find a little bent over, stooped over Jew, fixing windows, he's a glazier, and this glazier though, who knows if he wasn't from the Lamed Vod Tzadikim, having this time, this Dibur, every Chodesh Elo, and the little children were very much aware of it. In a different way, I saw how this city of Yerushalayim is just not like other cities. When I was uh, on a bus, in uh, a plain old Egged bus, riding the bus in Yerushalayim, and uh, number one, you see how they, one thing that the Israelis have is tremendous derech eretz and kavod, if they say the takum, an elderly person gets on the bus, they immediately stand for him, man, woman, they stand for this person. It's something we can all learn from. But it so happens in this particular ride, an elderly Jew got on the bus, and uh, he didn't pay his fare. And the bus driver called him up and said, Adonia, Adonia, no shilamta. You didn't pay your fare. No. So he says, oh, 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 slicha Adonia. So he says he took out a, so he took out a little candy from his pocket. And the bus driver says, Mazir. So he said to him, Yesh whiskey bifnim. Inside this candy is a little, some whiskey. Enjoy it. The bus driver looked at him and said, go ahead, take a seat. Shev Adonia, and that's it. And where are you going to see this? Imagine getting on a bus in New York City and paying your way with a candy that has whiskey bifnim. That's Eretz Yisrael, that's our Jews, that's the wonderful country that we have. In thinking about the state of Israel on Yom Ha'atzma'ut, it's hard to overstate its impact on my personal life, as well as on the life of our entire nation. Um, Rabbi Rosenberg asked me to speak about the bracha of the State of Israel in the context of my personal life. And in that light, I'd like to share an interesting story with you. Um, it happened a number of years ago, and uh, I was on a tiyul with uh, my son and my oldest daughter, as well as one of my nephews. And uh, the tiyul that we were taking that day is from Beit Shemesh, which is sort of uh, on highway number one between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. And we were interested in going to visit Masada, a classic uh, tourist location, which my kids had not been to. And uh, so we got there, got a little bit of a late start, and it turns out that uh, Israeli national parks tend to close a bit earlier than uh, I was expecting. And although it was uh, broad daylight, we pulled in about a half hour after the park had already closed, and uh, they would no longer let anybody up. So we were very frustrated about that. And uh, the guard who was there said, well, they were having some sort of light show that night and we might want to stay. And we were thinking about that and going back and forth, what should we do? But in the meantime, we had no food and we had to figure out what to do. So we went back uh, to the local town of Arad, uh, which is a, a small city uh, not so far away. And we went there to get dinner and to look after my son's ear. He hadn't been feeling well with his ear. And as we were sitting in the restaurant trying to figure out what to do and how to take care of his ear, he was in a bunch of pain, uh, a woman overheard us as we were describing, talking about among ourselves about what to do, and she said, oh, uh, I hear that you're Americans, and I hear that you're, uh, I can see that you're, you keep kosher and all of that, and I see that your son has problems uh, with his ear, so, if you need a place to look after, after his ear, so I can rec to tell you where to go. And she gave us instructions about that. And she said, and if you need a place to stay, because you're disappointed that you didn't get to say Masad, it's no big deal, just stay with us. And so, uh, that's in fact what happened. She gave us instructions to go uh, have my son's ear looked after, which we did. Uh, it was a little, little, a little hard to find in the middle of the night, but uh, we found it. And then we went back to her house, and she put us up there uh, with total strangers, inviting total strangers into their home on no notice, uh, four of us. And um, uh, she fed us, and we visited the donkey that she had in her backyard. 
And uh, we got up and went in the morning, and we were able to get to Masada uh, in time for sunrise. I had no tefillin, because I wasn't expecting to be there, but uh, one of the other minyanim that finished up, uh, I borrowed somebody's tefillin and I davened uh, shortly after sunrise there. We conclu concluded our little tour, as long as my son's ear could hold out, and we left. And uh, it was just a great experience, and in some ways really characteristic of the bracha of Eretz Yisrael, because where else do you get genuine hafnasot orchim like that? A total stranger, don't know him from a hole in the wall, over the, overhears your conversation in a restaurant and decides, I know, I'm going to have these four strangers over, sleep at my house, feed them, set them on their way, do this, do that for them. It was uh, really an incredibly memorable experience. On that same little trip, uh, we were driving along at some point and we were thirsty and we stopped at some little roadside store to pick up some juice or some soda and um, it turns out it was like some sort of Bedouin tent of some sort or other and we bought our sodas and they said, come, come on in. And so we did and um, the way they served us was they had us lie down on long couch-like things, uh, kind of on the ground, low to the ground, I guess mats I suppose, and in front of each of our heads we were to lie in such a way that our heads, right in front of our heads, were small little tables, and they placed our sodas and juices on those things. And as I was chatting with uh, my, uh, my kids and my nephew, it dawned on me that this is Haseba. This is exactly the mitzvah Haseba that we do at our Pesach Seders. And uh, I mentioned to them, we were talking about it a little bit, and then I kind of forgot about it. And then at some point I said, you know, we should do that in our own house. That's how we should do... Um, that's how we should do uh, our Pesach Seders, and I said it once, and I forgot about it. And uh, a year or so later, I came back on Seder night from uh, shul, and I discovered that uh, my family members had put together an entire uh, Seder plate. It's actually over here, and um, it's kind of messy now. But um, And they put together uh, sheets and a table and everything, and we did Haseba on our family couches, and that is to this day what we do. And so on that short little trip, I learned so much about Torah and mitzvot. I learned about mitzvot bein adam l'chaviro from the tremendous hachna sotorachim that we received uh, from a total stranger that night, to whom we're still so grateful. And we learned about uh, mitzvot bein adam l'makom uh, from the friendly Bedouin hospitality that we received. Those are the sorts of things which, and experiences and ideas which uh, make Israel the special place that it is at the human level, at the person-to-person -person level. And um, it's, it's those and so many zillions of other memories like that that make the state of Israel the great thing that it is today. My personal experiences many years ago in Eretz Yisrael um, taught me in a very searing sort of a way both the fragility of life as well as the need for continuity and for moving on despite unanswered questions. Uh, my first visit to Eretz Yisrael was with my sister, Aleha Shalom, and the reason why I made that visit in fact, was to meet a certain young lady with whom I'd been corresponding for a number of years as a friend. And I thought that it might become more than a friendship. And indeed, over the course of that visit, that summer visit, it felt like it was becoming more than a friendship. And we felt that we were actually going to get married. Um, when my sister and I came back, things changed. The magical atmosphere was gone, and it turned out that we didn't get married. I made a second trip a few months later to break up. Uh, it, nowadays, people would break up with an email or maybe a tweet. Uh, I felt that the relationship deserved a visit. And the reason why I'm reminded of this is because just perhaps ten years later, my sister, Allah Shalom, had passed away from breast cancer. 
and this and after being married and having several children and this young lady also got married and divorced to somebody else had a child in the during her marriage and also passed away I believe also from the same disease and I think back on that visit and these are some of my unanswered questions uh, but on the other hand a few months later, I began a year of study in Israel with a trip together with my Rebbe, Rav Shechter. And I was on a program called Mivtsa Elef, in which a thousand families were helped to visit Israel and get a taste of what it was like. And he was one of the scholars for one of the programs. And in the course of one of his talks, he mentioned that there was a particular melody that he had played when he walked down to his chuppah. Uh, and there was a beautiful melody, and that Rav Tabori from the Gush, from Yeshivat Haratzion, had liked that melody so much that he had played it when he walked down to his chuppah as well. And towards the very end of that trip, I prevailed upon Rav Shechter in the hotel lobby to record that melody, that nigun. And I learned it, and when I was Zoha to meet my wife Dina, I played it as I walked down to my chuppah. Many of you in the Eitz Chaim audience know that melody because it's the Habein Yaker Li Ephraim that I incorporate into the Musaf on Rosh Hashanah. And so on the one hand are the questions and the fragility of life and how some people, on Yom HaZikaron reminds us that some people don't get older with us. We leave them somehow always in their youth having passed away young. And at the same time, Hashem has plans for us, and we go on, and we find simcha, and we find love, and we try to make our lives worthwhile and meaningful, and to celebrate a Yom Ha'atzma'ut, even with the questions being able to rejoice nonetheless. So, a Yom Ha'atzma'ut Sameach to us all. I welcome the opportunity to be able to say a few words uh, on behalf of their tesoro. Uh, it's sort of ironic that uh, that we, speaking to Yidin Shomotari Bitsis, that we even have to speak about uh, tesoro. Uh, someone just with a little bit of concentration in terms of our tefillos uh, three times a day uh, in the Shemani Yisrael, where there's uh, a special brachas, Rishlai Mirchos, Semach David, which our tefillos are focused, uh, of course, uh, Teretz Yisrael, and the benching, whatever we eat. We can't forget to thank Hashem Yisbarach for eat, and then again, it's always going back to Teretz Yisrael, which uh, the simple understanding is, because even when we are living in Chutz Laretz, we have to understand that our bracha really comes from Teretz Yisrael. All the Shpoiz Toiv is according to the Zohar HaKodesh, is really from Teretz Yisrael. So when we are here in Chutz Laretz, we have to understand not to feel comfortable that being here in Chutz Laretz and saying that even when Bechaz De Hashem when we are able to make a go of it and live comfortable lives, but we have to understand we our schus really comes from the hashpoes um, of Eretz Yisrael. That is the shayrish, that is the makar of all of the brachas. Uh, for me, it is, uh, very personally, I still really can't get over it, the tremendous schus that we have, thinking about all the great G'doy Yisrael, starting back even from Moshe Rabbeinu, with the Rabban Shal Yisrael, did not have the schus to enter at Yisrael in spite of all the many, many tefillahs that he was mispalo. Uh, we find throughout the ages the Vilna Goyim, the Goyim of Vilna, who had planned to go to Eretz Yisrael. And Shemaim had different plans for him. He did not make it to Eretz Yisrael. The Chofetz Chaim, as of late, Mishnah Brewer, Poisik Hador, but can imagine, the Kodesh Baruch Hu, certainly, with Sayin Yerei of Yasa, and yet, the special reasons, of course, unknown to us, was not Zechet Kote Yisrael. And yet, we have the opportunity, Baruch Hashem, just we'll have to buy a ticket and just go fly to Yisrael whenever we'd like to. 
I can say very personally, to me, it's, it's Kedai just even to be able to go to the Koisel Dam in one Mairev. I remember, as we say, Nish Dogedacht, when I lost uh, my parents, and there was a very quick trip to Eretz Yisrael for Kavur on the Harazesim, and uh, there was a short shiva there because the flight coming back to New York was almost immediate, a few hours later. But I remember when I was asked, what uh, would you like to do here in Eretz Yisrael very quickly, and I remember trying to say, if I had the opportunity, they were just to go to the coastal and be able to be misbottled over there. And um, I'm aware of people that I know very personally that sometimes would take a trip, literally a one hour, one day, a 24 hour trip, one day trip, simply to have the schus to be able to be misbottled at the Mukhaim Sekhdoshim. For me, I always say when people ask me regarding Edsy Soil, because I try to make it at least once a year. Originally, the reason is quite simply, first of all, I was forced to do it, I mean, others to make that decision. Uh, in spite of many, many tirdis, uh, both of my parents are buried in Eretz Yisrael, and I tried to make a piece for one of the yard sites, but there are clouds my father's yard site, which is after Sukkot. They asked me, what is, what do you find in Eretz Yisrael to be, well, what's the most enlightening, and what is the most difficult thing about Eretz Yisrael? And I said, the most difficult thing for me in Eretz Yisrael is having to leave Eretz Yisrael. Uh, there is something about it that the Kedush of Eretz was very palpable. And it's just something when you just get on the plane and you're going back on the way home and just the, the plane lifts off and you just look down out of the window to see Eretz Yisrael just in the background. To me, really, as, as they say in Yiddish, it's a shtoch in hearts. And uh, this is, uh, I thought this was the first time when it happened. I thought, well, this is a one-time thing. But it doesn't matter. In Eretz Yisrael, I know her many, many times. Hashem Yadu to be able to continue. Halavai Mashiach comes sooner. And um, always have that same feeling. Uh, I've been blessed uh, that I have um, children in Israel. I have a daughter, Ken Hauer, with six Sainiklich. And, and my Edom is Rosh Koil over there. And when I come to Israel, I say about five, six Shurim, different Makaymas. And um, uh, try to visit Gedoli soil over there. But I'm always wary of the fact that what the Chesam Seifer says, uh, Moshe Rabbeinu wanted to go into Eretz Israel, and the Chesam Seifer says, Listen, Moshe Rabbeinu, I want you to know first, you have to understand what Eretz Israel is all about. You want to go into Eretz Yisrael, but I want to explain to you the Cheshivas of Eretz Yisrael, as much as Moshe Rabbeinu knew, but because Moshe I want to enlighten you one more in the Kudit. Because the Seifer says in Parashat Vashanan, I want you, Moshe, to know that the Karka of Eretz Yisrael has more Kedusha than the Shemaim over Chutzlars. And the Mele, if they wouldn't understand what that means, with all of the Ruchniyas, Kanan Ahara, that we're able to enjoy here in Chutzlars, but to realize that just simply the Karka of Eretz Yisrael has more Kedusha then that is, and as I say again, the Chedusha Rim says, and I think we should always be reminded of that, that I will take you out of the burden that Yidin suffered in Mitzrayim. So the Chedusha Rim says, part of the problem is being in Golos is you 